Uh, let me welcome you to Grace Point if you're here for the first time. Uh, I'm Eugene, I'm one of the pastors here. It's a pleasure to have you join us this Easter. If you're a regular, welcome back. Also, uh, nice to see some familiar visitors. Uh, Kevin, welcome, Kevin. Haven't seen you for a while. Uh, but it's, so it's good to actually have some old friends uh, visit us uh, who use the church here at Grace Point, but uh, who are actually uh, interstate. So I assume you're on holidays or something like that. Uh, friends, let me actually pray for us as we open up the Bible this Easter Sunday. Father, we do thank you that you reveal yourself in and through your word. We do pray and ask that we might be strengthened as we look at 1 Corinthians 15. We do thank you for Easter Sunday where we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We pray and ask this in his name. Amen. Uh, there is an outline in your order of services. You might want to pull that out. It's a little outline that's titled uh, An Easter Hope That Changes Everything. That might actually help you follow along. You will need your Bibles. We are looking at parts of 1 Corinthians uh, 15. Uh, most people, whether they are Christian or not, have not got a problem with the statement, Jesus died for you. You know, so Christian people believe Jesus died for you. If you said that to the average person on the street, most people have not got a problem with that. But the idea that Christ is risen... Uh, the idea that Jesus rose from the dead is probably uh, that one thing, the one thing about Christianity that most people have a problem with. Uh, I've shared this before at the Edinburgh Book Festival in 2010. Christopher Hitchens, atheist philosopher who wrote, God is not great, how religion poisons everything. He debated John Lennox, a professor in maths and the philosophy of science at Oxford. Uh, John Lennox had, in his conclusion, made mention of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The chair then gave the last word to Christopher Hitchens, giving him five minutes to respond. And Christopher Hitchens barked back, I won't need five minutes to respond to someone who believes in the resurrection. Why is that? Uh, lump people who believe Jesus rose from the dead with those who believe in the flat earth, or people who deny the moon landing, or people who believe... Uh, that a UFO landed in Roswell in 1947, and you can write them off. You don't have to engage with them. You don't have to consider any argument or evidence. Because if you did, you would have to think, you wouldn't have to, you know, to think about it. Because the presupposition is that people who believe Jesus rose from the dead are crazy people, loony people, as loony as people who believe in a flat earth. Now, to be fair, Christopher Hitchens, I do think, has got one thing right. The claim that Jesus rose from the dead actually makes or breaks the Christian faith. I don't know whether you realize that. The resurrection of Jesus is the hinge upon which the Christian faith stands or falls. Disprove the resurrection by coming up with a reasonable alternative to what happened, and you can actually end the Christian faith. Here's the other thing, though. If Jesus really rose from the dead what Christians celebrate at Easter, then you can't ignore him, can you? Uh, you can't simply dismiss his claims, his words, his teaching. Uh, you can't avoid him by pretending he, that he's of no significance. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said, all his claims. But if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said or claimed? And so everything actually hinges on whether Jesus rose from the dead. That's certainly the great realization, even for those who first heard about Jesus rising from the dead. If the resurrection was true, that means we can't live our lives any way we want. It also means that we don't have to be afraid of anything. We need not fear anything. The Roman sword, not injustice, not oppression, not war, not cancer, not COVID, not even death. If Jesus actually rose from the dead, it changes everything in life. Uh, if you have your Bibles with you, in this passage, Paul, who wrote this letter, begins by summarizing what is at the heart of the Christian faith, at the heart of what Christians believe. So if you stripped away everything, it's there in verse 3 and verse 4. This is actually what Christian people believe. We read verse 3, For what I receive I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, if you're a visitor or if you're a friend, uh, you know, a friend who's been brought by someone today, and you have no idea what Christians believe, or maybe you're a seeker and you're trying to work out what do Christian people believe, well, here it is in summary. Christian people actually believe that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. And I do want you to notice something about what is at the heart of Christianity. 
at the heart of what Christians believe, it's not any good work we do, but what Jesus does. You know, uh, the great myth is that Christianity is a religion of works, that somehow you have to work to save yourself, that you have to do good things to earn God's favor or earn God's acceptance. Now, it's, I want to say to you, that's a myth. Christianity is a religion of works, but it's not a work we do. It's a work that Jesus does to save, you know? And so Christianity is not like a, a religion of works where you pay for your guilt, where you have to make up for your past failures, like karma, where God is punishing you, and then you have to atone for your past. You have to make up for what you've done. The great myth is that Christianity is a moral religion, where your moral performance actually earns God's favor. That's simply not true, and that's far from the truth. Notice what Paul says in these verses. This is of first importance. Here is the main thing about what Christian people believe. Christ died for our sins. Notice, Jesus does something. It's Jesus' work that deals with our sin, our failure, our guilt, our, our, our fallenness. And so what actually happens is, that's what we celebrate at Good Friday, Jesus dies for our sins. He stands in the place of the rebel and he absorbs our judgment. Uh, Christ died for our sins. So we do nothing, he does everything by taking on himself our sin, our judgment, our guilt, our shame. Christian author Tim Keller, in his book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, this is what he writes. The second crucial tenet of what Christian people believe is that Jesus, in Jesus Christ, God came to earth and suffered with and for us. And it's unlike any other religious worldview. In Christianity, he says, Jesus comes to be with us. Not just to be with us, to be for us, sacrificially. And that is far more comforting than the idea that God is remote or that God is uninvolved in our world. He comes as one of us. And then he writes, the cross where Jesus died for our sins also proves that despite all the inscrutability, God is actually for us. How do you know God cares? Look at the cross where Jesus died and you know he cares. He loves. And then he says, the third doctrine is that true faith in Christ's work, not ours, true faith in his work on the cross, we can have assurance of our salvation and our forgiveness. That is far more comforting than the karmic systems of thought. We are assured that the difficulties of life are not payment for our past sins, since Jesus has paid for them. It's interesting, uh, Heidi Wong, that many of you uh, actually know uh, from Brisbane, married to to, uh, Mikey, she posted something this Easter Sunday. And she said, when Buddha died, his last words were, strive unceasingly. When Jesus died, his last words were, it is finished. You see that? One says, work to earn your salvation. The other one says, it's done for you. That's the difference. That's the difference. And so this is of first importance. This is what distinguishes Christianity from every other religious worldview. Christ died for our sins. We do nothing. He does everything. But notice you read a second thing. Christ was buried. You see there? It's it's the Bible's way of saying he actually died. He was crucified and he was placed in a stone tomb. He wasn't half dead or half conscious, right? Uh, He wasn't just unconscious as some people believe. Jesus actually physically died and was buried. Now, I say that because some people actually do believe that Jesus merely fainted or he pretended to be dead. And and when when the opportunity came, he just, you know, uh, it wasn't a real resurrection. He just... He was unconscious or he feigned death, pretended to be dead, and when he had the opportunity, he just got up. Now, the first thing I want to say is that there are a number of non-Christian sources that actually give us an account or report to us of the death of Jesus by crucifixion. Uh, So Roman historian uh, Josephus writes, Pilate had condemned Jesus to be crucified. Or Tacitus, another Roman historian, writes that Jesus suffered the extreme penalty of crucifixion during the reign of Tiberius, at the hands of the procurator Pontius Pilate. The records actually assume that Jesus died by crucifixion, not just the biblical records, the external records as well. And people who actually assume, because, you know, sometimes, you know, I I speak to people who actually say to me, well, Jesus didn't really die. He fainted, he feigned death, and then he came back to life. 
Well, people who think you can survive a crucifixion have probably never understood how first century crucifixion works. Crucifixion was a Roman method of execution designed to guarantee a slow death. That's what it was designed for, to guarantee a slow death. Uh, we know if you read the Easter accounts of Jesus, what's the first thing that happens to Jesus? We read that he was flogged. Uh, this, is what's happened, uh, this is what happens in a Roman flogging before crucifixion. Uh, we read uh, flogging as practiced by the Romans involved the use of a brutal instrument called a flagrum. It's like a whip, a whip with uh, um, leather, and the leather had pieces of metal and bone attached to it. It bit deep into the human flesh that resulted in the victims sometimes dying under its use. Basically, it was a whip designed to inflict as much trauma as possible. That's how it was designed, uh, to rip off your flesh and your skin, to induce trauma. We read that Jesus was then crucified. Now, what does that mean? That means he was nailed to a wooden cross structure and that seven-inch nails were hammered into his hands and his feet. You know, not those little Ikea nails that you have. Seven-inch nails like those bolts that you actually find. And the arrangement was really designed to maximize suffering. That was the purpose of a Roman crucifixion, to make it hard for you to breathe. That's why your hands were outstretched. That's why they nailed your feet, uh, to give you just enough support so that you could push yourself up, but then you would then collapse again. It was designed to sort of keep you alive and prolong your suffering so you died slowly. And, and it was designed that way so that you would struggle to breathe up and down with your hands outstretched because over time what would happen in a Roman crucifixion is that you would start to suffocate because your organs would shut down from lack of oxygen, your lungs would be filled with liquid, and then you drown basically in your own bodily fluids because your lungs get flooded basically with liquid. Death by crucifixion was designed, was designed to be a slow death. But we also know when you read the accounts of Jesus in the Gospels, we read Jesus was also speared in the side to ensure that he actually died. We know that one of the accounts of the crucifixions of Jesus tells us that blood and water flowed from his side when he was speared. That means he died of a massive blood clot in his main arteries. And so it's quite hard to imagine that Jesus was pretending or pretending he had fainted. It's hard to believe that he was able to fool his executioners. The Roman soldier's job who executed prisoners by crucifixion, they were professionals at their job. They did that for a living, right? And so their job was to ensure that someone actually, people who were crucified were actually dead. They did it to guarantee a slow death. They knew what they were doing. And then Jesus, we know, he was then embalmed. And if you know anything about embalming in the New Testament, he was embalmed with over 25 kilos worth of spices, tightly wrapped in 25 kilos of spices before being sealed in a stone tomb. And so I always say to people, uh, imagine with me for a moment, imagine this, Jesus is flogged to a point where his back is unrecognizable, ripped to the bone, he can't carry his own cross, He's there nailed to a cross. His side is pierced with a spear. And through it all, he pretends to be dead. He then allows himself to be wrapped in 25 kilos worth of spices and cloth. And then he waits. And then when he has the opportunity, he removes all the binding. And then he single-handedly rolls the stone away from the door, which takes quite a number of people to move. And then he actually gets past the Roman armed guards guarding the tomb. Friends, Christ died and was buried. The evidence for the death of Jesus is so strong that German atheist scholar Gerd Ludemann, who is a historian, he writes, Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. Christ died and was buried. But then we also read a third thing about what Christian people believe. <clears throat> Christ was raised, raised on the third day. He physically rose from the dead. Now, this is where, uh, this is what, is, I think, the most difficult thing for people to believe. A resurrection takes place. The one who died comes back to life. And as you read verse 5 to verse 8, Paul tells us that there were eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. Right? So you read verse 5. He appeared to Kephas, then the 12. After that, to 500 of the brothers and sisters, and on and on it goes. And so I want to say to you that this is actually at the heart of what Christian people believe. Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and was raised back to life on the third day following his death. 
But it's that third one, isn't it? That's really, really hard to swallow. It's hard to buy that one. The resurrection. The whole idea of someone coming back from the dead is very, very difficult to believe. It's impossible. But that's the whole point. If Jesus actually died and never came back to life, it makes him no different to every other religious leader because he's dead, just like them. What makes the claims of Jesus greater than anyone else? Well, everything hinges on the resurrection. And the challenge to the claim that Jesus rose from the dead is actually not a new one. Because Paul, who wrote what was read for us from 1 Corinthians 15, also faced the same objection. You know, sometimes people say to me, ah, people in the first century, they were backward. That's why they believe in a resurrection. Us 21st century people, right? We are, we, you know, we're scientific now. We, we don't buy resurrection theories, right? But you know what? 21st century people have problems with the dead coming back to life. First century people also have the same problem believing that the dead come back to, to, to life. Because dead people simply don't come back to life. And so they had objections too. And that's what you read in verse 12. If you come down, we meet a verse 12, we read, because Paul is meeting the same objection. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? You see there? Because there are implications if there is no resurrection. There are implications if Jesus did not rise from the dead. And I want to highlight three. Here are a few, not just for Christians, but for all people as we'll see. And so the first one is in verse 14. So have a look at verse 14 with me. If Christ had not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. You see there? If Jesus did not rise from the dead, our preaching and our faith, that is our trust in Jesus, is useless. It's a waste of time making Jesus known. The Christian mission is useless. Spreading the message of Christianity is a waste of time. There's no point proclaiming a dead savior. There's no point proclaiming a dead king. Calling people to submit to someone who is dead or calling people to trust someone who is dead is useless. Such preaching is empty because your message is Jesus died and was buried. What good is a message like that? You might as well preach Buddha or Muhammad or anyone else who claims to be the savior of the world. They all made claims and they're all dead. So what makes Christianity unique is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. You take out the resurrection, and preaching Jesus is a very useless enterprise. Even more than that, we read in this verse that your faith, and faith as the dictionary defines it, is trust or confidence in something, right? If Jesus did not rise from the dead, your complete trust and your confidence in Jesus to save you is useless. If he's still in the grave, Your trust and confidence in Jesus is absolutely useless. Why? Come down to verse 16 and verse 17, and there we read, For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Your trust and confidence in Jesus to pay for your sins is worthless. What gives you the confidence that the work of a dead man has or can actually deal with your sin, your guilt, your past. You might as well trust in the sacrifice of a goat or a cow to pay for your sins. What makes Jesus' sacrifice any greater than anyone else who says, I'll die to pay for your sin? And so the value of that claim is useless unless he rose from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then your trust in him is useless Everything that is taught about Jesus is also a waste of time. Now, there is a second implication in verse 15. So if you look at verse 15 with me, we read, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, it means we've been promoting and we're teaching a lie. We've been deceiving and we've been deceived. And so look at what Paul says. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. And so, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, it means that Christian people are not just people who have been deceived, they're also liars. They are deceivers. They are teaching lies about God when they say God raised Jesus from the dead. 
If Jesus did not rise from the dead, it means Christians have been perpetuating and spreading a lie for the last 2,000 years. A lie that we celebrate every Sunday when we do church. A lie that continues every Sunday across the world. It means that Christian people are on a mission to spread a lie. That means the church is a gathering of liars who've been deceived and who are seeking to deceive people. Now, it's worth pausing and asking this question, isn't it? Would you be prepared to suffer for a lie? Good question, isn't it? Would you sacrifice your life for a lie? Would you be prepared to die for a lie? And, and the reason why I raise that question is because sometimes people will say, well, the early church, uh, the disciples of Jesus, they lied about the resurrection. And so it's worth asking, would you be prepared to die for a lie? What, would, what, what, what are they going to gain from lying? Because it's a question that Paul actually asks. Come now, we meet at verse 30 and verse 31. Here's another objection Paul deals with. You discover that Paul was actually prepared to do just that. He was actually prepared to be rejected, to be abused, to be persecuted, to be intimidated, to be imprisoned, to make the, the message of Jesus, his death and his resurrection known. And so you read verse 30, and as for us, <clears throat> why do we endanger ourselves every hour? Why are we prepared to do this? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Jesus. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? And so Paul is actually starting to answer this objection, right, that he's perpetuating a lie. And so Paul raises this question, what do I gain if I suffer for a man who remains in the grave? What do I gain from being thrown to the lions for a man who is dead? Have you ever wondered why people lie? People lie to gain an advantage, don't they? Uh, the movie Catch Me If You Can is the real-life story of Frank Abagnale, uh, the real-life story of a con man, a fraudster, uh, a scam artist, and who, who was an expert at lying. He would lie to gain an advantage, money, women, status, praise, whole host of things. Uh, and so if you know anything about his life, he pretends to be a pilot so he can get free flights. He pretends to be a lawyer to get a job at a state attorney's office. He pretends to be a pediatrician to gain respect. He lies to gain fame and money and respect, admiration. But it's very, very interesting that Frank avoided certain lies. He never pretended to be a sex offender. He never pretended to be a drug addict. Why? Because if you pretend and you lie and you pretend to be an addict or a sex offender, what would that bring you? It brings you isolation, it brings you rejection, it brings you opposition. There's no advantage telling such lies. So let me tell you, the first step to telling a good lie, you know the first step to telling a good lie? Is to choose a lie that's gonna give you an advantage in life. Because that's why people lie, to gain something, to benefit from something. And so here's the question that Paul raises in these verses. What's the benefit of making up a lie about Jesus rising from the dead. Because all it brought Paul was rejection and abuse and persecution and intimidation and imprisonment and eventually death by Roman execution. You know, what advantage or benefit did the first disciples and the early church get from making up a lie that Jesus rose from the dead? You see, these are perks of the lie. You want to know the perks of the lie? Virtually all the disciples of Jesus and the early Christian leaders died for their faith in very, very violent ways. And the story of the early church is a story of violent persecution. And so it's very hard to believe that people would actually die for a lie because it gains them nothing. As Pascal puts it, I believe those witnesses that get their throats cut. Why would you die for a lie that brought you nothing but rejection, ridicule, torture, and death? It's an interesting question to ask, isn't it? Can you see what I'm saying? Liars actually make very bad martyrs. Who willingly sacrifices and dies for a lie to perpetuate a lie? One writer actually says, it's not enough to be for the skeptic. It's not enough for the unbeliever who denies the resurrection of Jesus to dismiss the Christian belief in the resurrection. So it's not good enough to say, it just couldn't have happened. He or she must face this historical question. 
Why did Christianity emerge so rapidly with such power? No other band of followers in that era concluded their leader was raised from the dead. Why did this group do so? What was the benefit? How do you account for the hundreds of eyewitnesses who didn't just maintain that they saw Jesus alive, but who eventually gave their lives for this belief? You see, the skeptic, the unbeliever, must also give a reasonable explanation for this. Now, there's a third implication. You find it in verse 18 and verse 20. Have a look with me. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, it means death wins. Death is the end, and, the, and this life is all there is. Look at what it says. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, verse 18, then those also who have fallen asleep, those who have died in Christ, are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are, of all people, most to be pitied. In other words, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then death is the last and the final word for each one of us in life. That means if we place our hope in Jesus, we should be pitied more than everyone else on the face of the planet because we put our hope in a dead man. Those who have trusted in him who have died, it means they're lost forever. They're just as dead today as they will be tomorrow. And people who trust in him today should be pitied because they're anchoring in a lie. And so if the Christian faith is based on a lie about Jesus, if the Christian faith is based on a savior who's still in the grave, anyone else is better off than the Christian. If there's no resurrection, we should all go home right now and not come back next week. The resurrection of Jesus is the hinge on which the Christian faith, your faith, and my faith stands or falls. You see, most people think that when it comes to the claim that Jesus rose from the dead, the burden of proof is on the Christian to give evidence that it happens. You know, most people think like that. Christians, you must, you must actually show us proof that it happened. That's actually not completely true. The resurrection of Jesus also puts a burden of proof on those who don't believe that the resurrection took place. And so maybe you're a visitor here today, or maybe a friend has brought you. If you're a skeptic, if you're an unbeliever, it's not enough to simply say, Jesus didn't rise from the dead or it was a hoax. You've got to come up with a historical, feasible, feasible alternative explanation for how the Christian faith began. You've got to give a historically feasible explanation for what actually happened that first Easter. Give me an alternative. You know, if you're a skeptic or maybe you're an unbeliever, a friend has brought you, you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you to examine the evidence for the resurrection. Don't just dismiss it. Examine it and come up with a historically feasible alternative explanation. And I do want to say this. If you can do that and you can reasonably debunk the resurrection, I'll join you. I'll be an advocate. I'll be an advocate denying the resurrection and trying to convert people out of Christianity, basically. I will hand in my resignation and I'll leave the church. You know, it's really interesting. I said to the morning church, you know, it's been about 24 years I've been at Grace Point, And I, every couple of years, I actually put out that challenge. And no one has taken me up on it. And maybe someone will today. I'm happy to have, explore the resurrection with you. If you could debunk the resurrection, come up with a historically feasible explanation and alternative, I'll hand in my resignation and I will be an evangelist to convert people out of Christianity. If you want to take that up, feel free to have a chat with me. There's only one condition, though. You've got to be prepared to examine the evidence. And if you can disprove the historicity of Jesus Christ who died, who was buried, and who rose from the dead, and if you can offer a historically feasible alternative account, I will do that. I'll be an evangelist to convert people out of Christianity. But if you can't, then you need to rethink Jesus, where you stand with Jesus, because it means he can't be ignored. You interested in doing that? I'm willing to take you up on that if you're willing to take me up on that. In fact, notice what Paul says. He goes on to say, verse 32, if the dead are not raised, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then the most logical thing to do is to live it up now. See that verse 32? If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. If death is the end, then do all you can to enjoy and get the most out of life now if there's no resurrection, if there's nothing beyond. Do all you can to indulge yourself, to gratify yourself. Why concern yourself 
with justice and mercy? Why bother with caring for the poor and the refugee? Why give aid to help the suffering? Why worry about what's happening in Ukraine? Why try to find purpose and meaning in life? Discover your purpose and meaning in making sure you get the most out of life now if death is the end and there's nothing more. You should just live it up. And so Paul says, notice, if the dead are not raised, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, then we should all live selfishly because death brings everything to an end. Now, if you're a skeptic or maybe you're not a Christian or maybe you're someone who doesn't believe in anything beyond the material world, what you see is what you get. You know, some people live, live that, you know, that's their worldview, right? What you see is what you get. Someone who holds uh, basically a naturalistic or materialistic worldview. I want to say, what might surprise you is that even if you didn't believe or you didn't want to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, I want to suggest to you that you would want it to be true. Let me tell you why. Whether you're a Christian or not, you care deeply about justice for the poor. You care deeply about the way refugees are treated. You care deeply about global poverty. You care deeply about the environment. You care deeply about equality. You care deeply about victimization and abuse. Yet you believe that the material world is all there is. What you see is what you get. You believe that the material world is caused by an accident, a product of chance, an evolutionary process that will eventually end with the death of the sun. And so here's my question to you. So why do you care about justice for the poor? Why do you care about suffering for those on the other side of the planet in Ukraine? Why sacrifice for the needs of others when you believe in the end, nothing you do now or tomorrow will really count because death brings it to an end? Why fight for racial, gender, and social equality? Interesting, isn't it? A secular worldview makes any motivation you have to make the world a better place absurd if at the end there is nothing because death brings it to an end, so why bother? And so I don't know whether you've realized it. Has it ever occurred to you that if there was no resurrection, then any good you do today, any justice you secure for the needy, has no value because death brings it to an end? What you do is only a band-aid to a problem that can never be fixed. Evolutionary uh, biologist Richard Dawkins, one of the things I love about Richard Dawkins is not just... He's not just a biologist, he's an atheist, but he's a consistent atheist. That's why I like Richard Dawkins, because he's consistent. And I often, uh, tell, uh, tell, I often share what he writes, because he's consistent. Uh, atheist biologist uh, Richard Dawkins writes, we live in a universe of blind physical forces and genetic replications. And this is his explanation to evil. Some people are going to get hurt, others are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice, because what you see is what you get. There's no reason for it. That's just a materialist view. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, our DNA knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. If there's no reason for anything in a materialistic universe, apart from what we observe, if there's no purpose, and if death is the end in the universe, if there is no design, because to believe in design is to assume a designer, if there's no such thing as good or evil, because to believe in good and evil assumes a higher moral authority, why do you care? Why sacrifice to make the world a better place? Why care about justice? Why fight for racial and gender and social equality? Why give to end poverty? If there's nothing beyond death, doesn't it make more sense to live it up now, to be selfish, to think of yourself, to be self-indulgent? In fact, evolution would actually suggest that you shouldn't care because the weak should just be left to die. What's playing out in Europe is nothing more than evolution taking place, isn't it? Survival of the fittest and the strongest. But if the resurrection of Jesus actually happened, then it changes everything, isn't it? It gives us a reason to care about justice, to sacrifice, to make the world a better place, to work to end poverty, to provide aid to the refugee and suffering, because we know there is more beyond. The work we start now will lead to a restoration, to a completion. N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, puts it like this. The message of the resurrection is that this world matters. 
that the injustices and pains of the present and, and pains of the present must now be addressed with the news that healing, justice, and love have won because Jesus has risen over death, the ultimate evil. There is hope for the suffering. There'll be justice for the victims of injustice. There'll be vindication for the poor who have been taken advantage of because death will not be the last word. There will be a reversal. If Easter means Jesus Christ is only raised in a spiritual sense, then it's only about me and finding a new dimension in my personal spiritual life. But if Jesus Christ is truly risen from the dead, Christianity becomes good news for the whole world. News which warms our hearts precisely because it isn't just about warming hearts. Easter means that in a world where injustice, violence, and degradation are endemic, God is not prepared to tolerate such things and that we will work and plan with all the energy of God to implement the victory of Jesus over them because he has risen over death, there will be a restoration. Friends, the resurrection actually changes everything. And that's exactly the point Paul tries to make here. If you read verse 20 and verse 22, he says, if Jesus is risen, it actually now means today, death is not the last word. It will never be the last word. There's hope, there's comfort, there's a reason to sacrifice, there's a reason to preach, there's a reason to suffer, there's a reason to care, because there will be a resurrection, there will be a reversal, and there will be a restoration. Look at how Paul puts it, verse 20. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. If Jesus has risen, it means everyone who trusts in him will one day rise from the dead. There will be a reversal and restoration. Now, the materialists, the secularists will say, the world as we know it is it. The secular looks at the world and says, death, death is the end, nothing more. When you die, you cease to exist. You rot in the grave. Your loved one remains in the grave, you are forever separated. But notice what Paul says. Paul says, the Christian has a very different hope. Many, many years ago, I was once called out to hospital because a family friend's mum had actually died. I arrived, and the body was still there in the hospital bed. The couple were there waiting for me. And you see the deceased. Uh, you see the grieving couple, and it's a, very, it's a deeply distressing uh, scene. Her body was there, but she was not there because life had left her. Now, you take a step back, right? From a secular perspective, okay? From a naturalistic perspective, death is just a biological process, isn't it? Life coming to an end, nothing more. Just accept it and get on with life. But everything in our heart rages against that. We are grieved by death. We are incensed and angry at death. Death grieves us. It's not right. Well, here's my question to the secular, the skeptic, the materialist. If the natural world is all there is, why do we fear death? And if we don't fear death, we grieve. Why do we wish things were different? Why do we look for comfort? Why do we seek answers? I suggest to you, maybe, just maybe, you wish there was something more than what you see. You see, a secular worldview of life offers no comfort. It just says... Accept death, suck it up, move on. Paul says the Christian has a different hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. Christian author Tim Keller puts it so beautifully, beautifully in this way. He says, The fourth great doctrine is that of the bodily resurrection from the dead for all who believe in Jesus. This completes the spectrum of our joys and consolations in life. One of the deepest desires of the human heart is for love without parting. Isn't that true? We wish the people we love lived forever because we want a love relationship that lasts. Needless to say, the prospect of the resurrection is far more comforting than the belief that death takes you into nothingness or into an impersonal spiritual substance. The resurrection goes beyond the promise of an ethereal, disembodied afterlife. We get our bodies back in a state of beauty and power that we cannot to today imagine. Jesus' resurrection body was corporal. It could be touched and embraced, and he ate food. 
and yet he passed through closed doors and could disappear. This is a material existence, but one beyond the bounds of our imagination. The idea of heaven, he writes, can be a consolation for suffering, a compensation for the life we have lost, vindication for those unjustly treated. But resurrection is not just consolation, it is restoration. It is reversal. We get it all back. The loved ones, the love, the goods, the beauties of this life, but in new, unimaginable degrees of glory and joy and strength. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus is the hinge upon which the Christian faith stands or falls. Disprove the resurrection and you end the Christian faith. But if the evidence shows that Jesus has risen from the dead, you cannot ignore him, can you? You can't sideline him. You can't ignore his claims. You cannot dismiss him. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything he said or claimed? Everything hinges on whether Jesus rose from the dead. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, then Christians would be pitied because they, they're wasting their lives, anchoring in him, building their lives around a lie, promoting, trusting, and suffering for it, and dying for it. It means Christian people are fools. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, it changes everything, doesn't it? If Jesus did rise from the dead, it would actually be foolish to not examine the evidence yourself. It would be foolish to ignore him and his claims. If you're not a Christian, or maybe you're a skeptic, a friend has brought you today, missionary Michael Green puts it like this. The resurrection, therefore, is the place to begin if you're looking for a satisfying faith on which to base your life that gives you a solid reason and hope to base your life. Start by looking at the resurrection of Jesus. Don't waste your time investigating every religion under the sun, from animism to Hinduism. Examine instead the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. If he is risen, you need not look any further. Let me encourage you to do just that. Can I say it's actually quite intellectually dishonest to write something off without actually examining the evidence. Maybe it's your first time here. Next week, we're kicking off Meet Jesus with Alan and Joe and a few others. Maybe that's the place where you can start examining the evidence. Or if you feel, have a chat with me because I'd love to have that conversation with you. If you are a Christian, let me encourage you this Easter. Church, you aren't wasting your life anchoring in Jesus. You're not a fool for trusting your life to Jesus. The work of making Jesus known is not a useless enterprise. Suffering and sacrificing for Jesus is not futile. Death need not crush us because Jesus rose from the dead. It changes everything for me and for you. Church, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.